Let us pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful to you that you have revealed yourself to us, that you have given us the wisdom and understanding of the Holy Spirit, your kingdom, that your word is true, and that all that you have written is from your mouth, inspired, living, active, and your word describes the world we live in perfectly. May you lead and guide us as we continue to study Genesis and study how it, it reveals the truth about this world. Thank you for all who come and attend. May you bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we were on question three, and the next few slides will be a quick, a quick review. Would you agree or disagree with the statement, God created all living things in exactly the form we see them today? And everybody says, no. Now, who would give me the why? Of this. Why do you say that? Because if you say that, then you're saying animals have changed, plants have changed. How have they changed? Hendon. If mutations, they, um, with the species of dogs, they can inter they can marry each other, have a different breed. You answered very well. Of the same kind, they can mate, and there is going to be mutations, change in their life. Animals have changed a lot because there are mutations. Uh, first of all, remember God created the animals peaceful, gentle, loving, vegetarians. Today, we have a whole different story, but in the garden, Adam and Eve had no fear of them, and the animals had no fear of Adam and Eve. That is the original creation. The wild nature of most animals today is not the way they were in the beginning. We have not seen animals in their original state. They are not in their original state because we are seeing and experiencing an animal world that is moaning and groaning under the effects of sin. That's Romans chapter 8. And we see that all over and I showed you some of these photos where this is not the original creation. Neither is this one. The beak, the claws, this whole body of this bird has probably changed very little, but its attitude has. Its way of using these things has changed, just like our bodies too. They are now instruments of sin, or they can be. And this is not a pretty picture, but this is what sin has done to the creation. And here we have starving, another one of those. Those are not beautiful, but the creation is moaning and groaning. And this is the creation that's waiting for the redemption of the sons of God. And it's the creation that Jesus Christ is making new. And we will live in a new world, this one that is restored. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. The evolutionist says there's always been death. There's always been violence. There's always been the survival of the fittest. The biblical view is no. 
the creation was created perfectly, how could God have said at the end of each day, this is good if animals were killing each other and there is disease and death? There's a big difference. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. That's from Romans 8, 1922. It's a very important revelation that God gives us. And then we looked at the peaceable kingdom, and this is where we ended. But Hicks drew these, and he's showing you some of the things from Isaiah chapter 11. And I'm not going to spend time with that. We're going to go on to the new material at this time. So, here's a question for you, and I, if you have an idea, let, me, let us know. How can we explain increasing bacterial resistance to antibiotics? Because the antibiotics we used 40 years ago don't work today. Why not? How do we explain mutating viruses like AIDS and like COVID? What's the biblical answer to that? Uh, the, the cells of the bacterium are they're mutating and losing information, so they do what they do to stay alive. But like we saw with COVID, the variants would keep getting weaker and weaker. So the COVID is still alive, but it, it doesn't have an effect anymore. Thank you, Kaden. You answered very, very well. All of the, the viruses that we've had or, or germs that we had in the past that were, many of them are killed by antibiotics, but there are some of them that are not. And those are the ones that continue to reproduce. And so they become the dominant uh, virus, they become the dominant germ, and so we have to then come up with new antibiotics to attack them. And then most of them will die, but some of them have don't have the information to die by this antibiotic. And so they continue to reproduce, and that's how it's going. COVID is running the same way. See, there's always going to be disease, but it's by mutation. The ones that survive are the ones that the antibiotic did not touch. Staph bacteria are very adaptable, and many varieties have become resistant to one or more antibiotics. So you're going to say, wow, they're gaining information. That's not what's happening. They are losing information. And the information that they had in their DNA that the uh, antibiotic would be able to destroy, that information is not in the modern staph bacteria. And so we have to find new antibiotics that are going to attack uh, these present bacteria. It's an ongoing battle, actually. For example, less than 10% of today's staph infections can be cured with penicillin that used to work very, very well. Up to half of the staph bacteria found in hospitals are resistant to common antibiotics. Why is that? Because the ones that survive are the ones that reproduce. And as they continue to reproduce, they are the dominant type of staph uh, bacteria. The emergence of antibiotic resistant strains of staph bacteria often described as, and I'm not saying I'm saying this right, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus strains has led to the use of stronger, more toxic antibiotics since as vanopomycin. And if I say that wrong, I apologize to you. But we have to keep making stronger more potent uh, uh, types of uh, antibiotics because there's always some 
that survive. A few strains of staph bacteria have become resistant to vancomycin also. So that is an ongoing thing. This would be an E. coli bacterium, and they have all their DNA. We can kill a whole bunch of them, but some are going to survive because there are different types of the E. coli bacteria. So they're going to reproduce, and then we have to find a way that we can attack them. Here Mr. is B. your AIDS virus. It continues to Mr. mutate as well. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say, uh, back a couple of slides ago, you read that they had to make stronger antibiotics, and I, I'd argue that that's not true because you the, may challenge me the, anytime. Go the uh, the uh, antibiotics they're they're adapted to go to fight the weaker actual virus or bacteria. I will stand corrected. Uh, anybody want to respond to that? John? Um, I think you're right, right on. The other thing I was going to add is there's an important aspect of this understanding of um, bacteria and their adaptability because the evolutionists will come in and say, uh, well, the, the virus or the bacteria responds and mutates in order to survive. That's very different than what we're portraying here is that God created um, bacteria and viruses with all sorts of variability, right? It, unless you kill 100%, there's a portion that will survive or mutate and survive, um, but it's, it's very different um, than what the evolutionist says. Thank you, John, and thank you, Katie. Anybody else? Then we have to look at these slides again. Now, when we talk about animals changing, this is called a long-haired collar. Easy to understand, right? What did the first collie have? Long hair or short hair? Because there is a short-haired collie also. <laughs> Do you know? What about medium hair? Say that again, Joel. Our medium hair. Medium. Yeah. We know that the collie species has information for long hair, also has information for short hair, and I'm not sure about medium, but it's possible. These are magpies. They're a bird. This is the Korean magpie. Then you have, oops, I'm sorry. Then you have the Eastern United States magpie. Are they the same? Same Any difference? Kind. Same kind and different species. Same kind, I think their wing structure is, a, their, the color of their wing is a little bit different. Did all the magpies come off of the ark? Their ancestors. Then we have the Western Australia magpie. You can see it's a magpie, right? But it's pretty easy to tell the difference. This is the Eastern Australia magpie. And then you have the Mongolia magpie. And then you have the Western United States magpie. And this is the Sri Lanka magpie. And this is the Pakistan magpie. What did the original magpie look like? 
all the information in magpies was right there. This is the Tibetan plateau magpie. I'm showing you these because when God created magpies, he created them with tons of information. And you can say, well, those are all magpies. I can see that. And here's another wonderful magpie, the Costa Rica magpie. Looks a lot like a blue jay. And there's the Philippine magpie. Is that right, uh, Mar Marcel? <laughs> Looks familiar? And then how about this uh, Filipino magpie dessert? Is that <laughs> That's also called a magpie. I throw that in just for some humor. <laughs> but all you have here is the revelation that when God created magpies, there is so much information in them. Christians have made the mistake of claiming the animals of today are exactly as they were when God created them. That is not true. We think if we, if we say that's not true, we think well, then we're becoming evolutionists. I want to define for you the difference between evolution and mutation. But I'm going to say this, this is simply not, not true the scriptures and the evidence that we see in the world today do not confirm that animals have not changed. A Romans 8 passage, I just read that to you. The, uh, Genesis 9, the fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground and upon all the fish of the sea they are given into your hands. And so in the original creation, there is peace and harmony. After the flood, God puts fear and dread of us in the animals, except the mosquitoes, right? Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Well, what we see now, we say there's suffering and frustration. Uh, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We're going to live in a creation that's restored forever and ever. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the veins of childbirth right up to the present time. So, mutations occur, but do not prove evolution. The secular world promotes the idea that mutations prove evolution. And a lot of Christians are afraid of mutations because they say, aren't we then becoming evolutionists? And so, I want to show you this. If you go to a museum, you're probably going to see a chart like this. And this is how the horse family has evolved. And there will be this kind of a thing. So 50 million years ago, horses as we know them didn't exist. Just little guys we have called hierarchical or something, sometimes called Eohippus, that stood only eight inches tall. That's what they will say. Here's some different species of dogs. Is that a beauty? Timber wolves and white wolves and spotted hyenas, and you have a red fox, and that's called a blue fox, and there are white foxes, and there's the gray fox, 
And there's this guy, the big ear. All that information is in the foxes that God created on day six. Here's a Saint Bernard. And here's a Saint Bernard. And here's a Saint Bernard. <laughs> Just amazing. These are your colleagues. Long hair, short hair. There's an English bulldog. Here is a Labrador Retriever. These are all dogs. Here's a German Shepherd. Here is a Dachshund. And here are several of them. How do you explain all of these different dogs when two dogs came off of the ark? These are poodles. Here's a poodle. <laughs> Don't you feel sorry for that? <laughs> Look at that. These are related. Look at that one. I found the worst ones I could find. <laughs> there should be some law against that. That's a poodle that they dyed the fur on. Isn't that cute? That's a poodle. And look at that one. So these are all kinds of dogs. They all come from a common gene pool. So by what process do you think these varieties of dogs came about? You have to first of all understand they come from a common gene pool. In the beginning, God created information. That information is in the DNA. And every dog we see today is revealing all of the information that God placed in their DNA to reveal his glory his power, his pleasure, his wisdom. This information reveals his infinite glory, wisdom, and power. We stand amazed. God, you create all these things. He told Adam and Eve to be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, probe, ponder, Look at my wisdom. Look at my power. Dogs change. They change by mutation. It is also known as natural selection. That's another way you may say it. Uh, I never like to use the word natural because I don't think anything is natural. I believe everything is God-controlled, God-orchestrated, it's all under God's hand. It is not the same as evolution. There are important distinctions between mutation and evolution, and Christians need to know the difference. This is one thing that has really helped me a lot to understand. So you have number six there. Some people say that mutation or natural selection and evolution are the same process. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? Why or why not? Well, mutation is a change within a kind. That is very significant. It's within the dog family. It's within the cat family. There is not a change from one kind into another. That is impossible. And there is no record anywhere of any kind changing to another. That's what evolution teaches. But it's a total assumption that has no validity. 
Anyway, so this is very significant. It's a change within a kind. <coughs> Secondly, it is a loss of information. Every generation loses information. I'm going to show you that pretty soon. It'll be kind of fun. And finally, mutation is the opposite of evolution. They are not the same. They're not similar. Although, if we don't understand these things, we're going to confuse them. And so that's why I'm bringing this out to you very carefully. It's a change within a kind caused by a loss of information. So here you have a male liger. A liger is a cat born from interbreeding a male lion and a female tiger. So we always use the first syllable of the male first and the second syllable of the female, and so we call it a liger, lion, tiger, liger, resulting in offspring with more lionistic features than with the reverse pairing. So this would be a mutation. The liger is a cat, born from interbreeding a male lion with a female tiger, this would be the female liger. And here is a male liger. Do you see the lion characteristics? This is a tiger. So the father would be a what? Tiger. Tiger. The mother would be a lion. lion. So I don't have to read all of that to you. But it has more of a tiger feature than it does a lion feature. So you have your lion in the upper left, you get your tiger in the lower right, you have a liger in your lower left, and you have a tigon in the upper right. This is all cat family, it's a change in kind, and so this would be mutation. A tigon, a ti tigon, is the offspring of a male tiger and a female tigon. Understand that one? You got this tigon and then you made it with a, a male tiger. And you have a leotan, which would be a male leopard and a female lion. I just find these things really fascinating. This is a leopard right here. And we're going to uh, cross the leopard with a, a male, uh, let's see, a male lion and a female leopard. This should not be a leopon. This should be, should be a male uh, leopard and a female lion. This information is wrong. I'm just catching it now. I'm sorry about that. Here's a zorse. I am sorry, Joe, I didn't see you. Okay, I'm just wondering all these different mutations you're showing. Does those happen naturally or does man intervene? In I believe man is the one that's bringing the issue up. Yeah. I believe that. I will stand corrected. Why don't we see this in nature more? Is that <laughs> because I think tigers are tigers. And they live in a tiger community. Lions are like lions. And I don't know whether tigers and lions fight. I they are in the same countries in the same locale. Yeah, that right. Lions are in Africa, tigers are in India. Okay. Yeah. Tigers are in India, but they're not in Africa. Lions are in Africa. Yeah, that would be a good answer to that. So thank you. But you can see this is a zorse, and these are zorses, and there's a zorse. Isn't that beautiful? And here's a really pretty zorse. Isn't that wonderful? So what would be the father? 
Okay. Einstein, the world's smallest stallion, stands just 20 inches tall as he approaches his first birthday. All the information for Einstein was placed in the horses when God created. But Einstein has lost the information for tallness. Yeah. Yes, pain and swollen. <laughs> a zonkey. Kind of cute. There's a zonkey. This is a camel. This is a result of interbreeding a camel with a llama. They are the same family. So here you have camels. Now, what is evolution? Evolution claims, and make sure you write the word claims, because there is no confirmation of this. There's no evidence of this. It claims one kind can change into another kind. And throughout the millions of years of history that they required they say there's a time when this kind became another kind. One-celled animals became two-celled animals, and so on and so forth. And so there's a huge difference between mutation and evolution. If evolution did happen, it would require a gain of information. Because we'll say we'd go from cats to dogs. You'd have to find, you'd have to have new information in your DNA in order to produce a dog. Cats, same information. But to change information uh, to another kind requires a gain of information. And finally, no scientist can give even one example of genes or DNA gaining information. There is no evidence. <coughs> there is no record. It has never happened. And yet that is what uh, evolution uh, is based on and that so many people embrace it without really studying it and asking the question. Is it possible? If somebody just says, well, we came from monkeys, you say, yeah, maybe we did. We kind of look like monkeys. Well, there is so much information for that to have to be gained that it is not possible. <coughs> we have many pictures of mutations. We have no pictures of evolution. All the things that you see are all artists' conceptions. And I just said it out of context. Because the question was, why don't you see it in nature? And I thought I knew, so I checked. But and, it, and sources cannot reproduce; they're sterile. And it said ligers. It said females can reproduce, but males have never been on the reproduce. The female liger can reproduce. Yeah, but the male is not. The male and is sterile. And the sources can't reproduce. Okay. Something like mules, I think. Yeah, right. uh, the horse and the donkey, I think, makes a mule, right, Dan? Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Appreciate it. So these are all the pig kind. Well, not all of them, but these are all pigs. They have mutated many different ways. But here you go. The various breeds of pigs, hogs, are mean, hey, that's such a cute one, isn't it? <laughs> so these are called teacup pigs. They are not mutations. These pigs are starved, stunted. The whole creation moans and groans. They're cute, but when you know their history,
these are cows. Many different varieties of cows, but they still remain cows. Here are your cows. All of them are the same kind. You like chickens? I know some of you live on the farm. I thought maybe you would like to see some of this stuff. These are silky phantom chickens. Isn't that beautiful? The information for them on day five when God created the birds. This is a gold lace. I want to say Wyan dots, dots. I'm not sure. Aren't they beautiful? Look at this one. Modern game bat. They look like proud birds. But they're chickens. And here you have the frizzle chicken. All the DNA for these kinds of birds, God created them. Here you have burgoo, duckle chicken of some sort. Look at the feathers on its feet. And here you have favor rolls, chickens, I say. And here you have sea bright chickens. Aren't you tempted to get some eggs and hatch those? So beautiful. Phoenix chickens. And you've got Brahma chicken. And Hamburg chicken. And Golden Forest chicken. All that DNA was in those birds. Plymouth Rocks, we have some of them around Iowa before, we've seen them. And then you've got this one. <laughs> I just show you all of those kinds of things because I just stand amazed at God's creativity. Number six. Some people say that mutation or natural selection and evolution are the same process. Do you agree or do you disagree with that statement? And everybody says, disagree. Mutations take place when genes or DNA lose information. <clears throat> Understand that. And there are dominant and recessive genes. Dominant genes are the ones that are going to reveal themselves in the next generation. Recessive genes are there, but they do not reveal themselves like the dominant genes. Now, we're going to do an exercise here. So, I'm using capital A for long hair, and capital A means it's dominant. The little a is short hair, it is recessive. Got that? Capital B, we're talking about hair color. The dominant color is black. The little b is going to stand for white. It's recessive. And we're going to just have three characteristics. By the way, you have thousands of characteristics in your own body. The dominant is tall. The recessive is short. So here we go. We have, I got that information up at the top to help you. We have a male, we'll call this a dog, okay? And in his genes, he has information for long hair and short hair. See that? Capital A, little a. He has information for black and information for white. And he has information for tall, and for short, the female has exactly the same thing. Now, let's say they get married and they have children. So, they could have, this first child could receive the dominant long hair and then 
they could he could get that from his father long hair and he could get long hair from his mother see that what information has this one lost short hair. he has lost short hair then let's go to color he could have the color black <coughs> from his father we always put the father's uh, inheritance first and he's got mom's black hair what information is lost all right so he cannot pass that on to the next generation how about for tallness he's got only tall information got that so remember every generation loses information but he's got a brother or a sister that could look like this what information is lost in his sister short hair, short hair, black hair. and blackness cannot be passed to the uh, next generation but has both tall and short uh, information here is another one. What information is lost in this one? Long hair, white hair, short hair. You are doing extremely well. What information is lost in this one? Black hair and tall. Okay, black hair and tall cannot be passed down. And what is lost in this one? Long hair. Long hair. Now, Let's say two of them get married. Gross. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are the possibilities? Could they have long hair or short hair children? Yes. yes. They could. Could they have black or white children? No. Could they have tall or short children? No. Only tall. So here is the possibility. They could be that way. There you have it. There is, that's the only way their children could be. There's no other information. Now, let's get rid of them, and let's say these two guys got married, all right? And here's the third generation, number two. What information is not going to be passed down? Black hair. Black hair. Black hair. There will be no black hair, but everything else is going to be available. They're going to be able to have these children. And so the only information lost in this generation would be the black hair. They cannot pass it down. Here's a snowshoe rabbit in winter. Did he have to learn to become white in the wintertime? An evolutionist would say he did. And you start doubting that because how long does it take a rabbit to learn to become white, huh? Why? Well, I gotta show you another picture. This is a snowshoe rabbit in the summertime. Got that? Here is the range of the snowshoe rabbits. Why are snowshoes common in this range and not in the rest of North America? Think about mutation. Think about loss of information. Kendon. To stay warm in the snow and its big feet will be nice for running on top of snow. So his big feet enables him to survive. What happens to all the rabbits with small feet? They sink. 
They die. How about the ones who are not snowshoe? What's what's their problem in the winter time? They don't they can't <laughs> See, they don't blend in with the snow. They're going to be killed off. And so all the information for you know the snowshoe rabbit is passed on. The other information is not passed on because they're killed off. Joe, you said something good? Yeah, I said they become blind. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Joe. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Look at this picture. You see two animals in there, right? Why do these animals survive in this environment? They blend in. Abby. They blend in. And so when we call natural selection, all the animals that cannot protect themselves are going to die off. And so the information that's passed down is going to be this color. All the other information is gone. Mutations take place when genes or DNA loses information. God created the first animals and Adam and Eve with all the information in their genes or DNA that we see in their kinds and their species today. There is no new information. Information is lost. One gram of DNA can store 700 terabytes of data. That's 14,000 50 gigabyte Blu-ray discs. I know this is antique stuff now. That's in a droplet of DNA that would fit on the tip of your pinky. That is a Blu-ray disc. All the information in one gram of DNA would take a 700 of these discs. No, 14,000 of these discs. Isn't that amazing? To store the same kind of data on hard drives, we would need 233 three terabyte drives weighing a total of 333 pounds. That just boggles my mind, like our 30 trillion debt. I don't know. And here you have a molecule of life. Every molecule, every cell of your body has 46 chromosomes. 30, or 23 from your father, 23 from your mother. And every one of your cells continues to reproduce those chromosomes. There are two meters, that's six feet, of DNA in each of your cells. And there are three billion DNA subunits, how they fit together. Approximately 30,000 genes code for proteins that perform most life functions. They decide every aspect about your body. And so, you have genes for your fingers. Some people have straight fingers, and some have tapered pointed fingers, and some have big knuckled fingers. Who's got the right one? Or you have your right hand pattern. The index finger is longer than your ring finger. That's in your DNA. Or some people have the index and ring finger the very same size. Look at yours and look at your dad and mom. See if you inherited theirs. Some people have a ring finger that's longer than their index. That's in your DNA. Passed down. And there's one more, and I see the clock is destroying this. You have hand shapes. You have an earth hand, which means you have short fingers 
and a large palm. Others, you have a fire hand shape, means my fingers are shorter, but I have a long, large palm. It's very big. Or you have the air hand shape, which by you have long fingers and you have a small palm. And then there is what they call the water hand shape, which has long fingers and a narrow, small palm. All DNA that you inherited from your family. Well, I was hoping to finish this lesson today, but we will finish it next week, hopefully. And then we're going to go into how many races are there. That'll be chapter 12. And I, I really want input from you on whether you want to continue these classes down the line. We'll probably get through the end of May when we're going to get through. And so let me know how you would like to continue. I really enjoy teaching. And you homeschoolers, if we can help you with things, I would really love to be able to do that. So, thank you everyone for coming. We're going to close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, your creation, your wisdom, your power, all of the information that you control, every aspect of our being we are fearfully and wonderfully made you knit us together in our mother's womb with 46 chromosomes we are so amazed may we glorify you in these bodies that you give us and we praise you for a wonderful evening in Jesus' name, amen. amen.